Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. My name is Chris Spangle. It's great to have you here. Today we are talking to uh, one of our Patreon members, the Wall Plus members, I should say, uh, Jeff Bennett. And uh, Jeff runs an ice cream store in and several businesses actually in California. And I thought a lot about Jeff over the course of the pandemic and wondering what experiences he's had as a business owner and wanted to have that conversation for you. So Jeff, thank you so much for joining me. Tell us a little bit about your businesses. Uh, thanks, Chris. Happy to be here. Uh, so my wife and I own a ice cream shop in California, a uh, small batch, independent, non-franchise uh, ice cream shop that we started. Uh, we also own a cafe um, in the same city. Um, and so, yeah, so we have two different food service businesses that have been uh, greatly impacted by the coronavirus this last year. So, so let's talk about March and April. I mean, when it first hit, what were your thoughts? Um, my first thoughts were, this is going to be something that's going to have a long lasting effect. I just saw the writing on the wall on that. A lot of people are like, oh, we're just going to close down for a couple of days and things will kind of get back to normal. And we had that, you know, 15 day shelter in place thing. And I'm like, no, this is, this is something that's going to be much further uh, for us as a business, it was also a very uncertain time. Um, there was a lot of a little sense of like the world's falling apart. <laughs> yeah. And so even in the, even in the time prior to the closing and the shelter in place, there was, you know, our business dramatically changed because we are trying, there's no real rules. It was kind of free for all. And it was like kind of doing our own thing. Um, and so as a business owner, it was trying to balance that, like what customers feel comfortable with and what our, our employees felt comfortable with and, and trying to find that happy medium. And there was so much, I would say, misinformation or different interpretations of the information that, you know, pretty much every person that you crossed had a different concept of what was right and what was wrong. And right. so it was, you know, there was a lot of challenges on, on making that experience in your business work. Um, you have now, a lot wait of a customers minute. that- I was under the impression and was told that lockdowns were necessary because evil businessmen like yourself don't care about the public and your employees and customers. You only care about the bottom line. You're telling me that's not true? Not true at all. What? Uh, <laughs> and actually, yeah, we, you know, I. And immediately it was a concern of ours of like, how do we, you know, for us, it's how do we keep our employees happy and safe? And um, especially in our business, our, our team is like a family. Uh, we have now we're down to 14 employees since the pandemic hit um, in our peak, we can be up to 30 employees. Um, and so, you know, those 14 people are our family. We see them day in, day out, you know, their, their health is just as important as ours. Um, and so when it first hit, we, you know, we, we had concerns of how do we keep them safe? Um, and then our customers too, like a lot of our customers are just as much family and, um, lifeblood to us that, you know, it's important that we keep them safe as well. So, um, yeah, so, you know, we tried to make our own rules and regulations and because every business was kind of doing something different, it just created a very challenging dynamic. Um, and you had a lot of people that didn't understand one way or the other. Um, but an it was an example of, of those differing views. Yeah. So um, it was definitely a kind of a challenging time. In what way? Did you lose uh, just in, yeah, just trying to, sorry, my computer did something funky there. Um, just in a, it was challenging and just trying to, I mean, it was like almost turning on a dime, you know, like it's you, you're so used to, we've been in business for uh, a little over five years now. And so, you know, we have our standards of practice and things just go and operations just work. And then all suddenly it's like, none of that works anymore. We can't do this, you know, and a lot of our business is really based around community and the involvement and interaction with the customer. Um, and so to all suddenly like not really be able to have that direct interaction. I mean, we serve ice cream. So sampling is a large part of what we do. Um, having conversation, explaining what is, 
what ingredients are in each of our flavors is an important part of what we do. And so taking away a lot of that, and then all suddenly, you know, we went to initially a curbside service thinking, keep people outside, people can stay in their car, they can choose to wear a mask or not. They don't have to follow any state or local mandate that they put a mask on because they're coming into a, a retail space. So we're going to keep them out on the curb and give them that freedom. Um, and then, you know, kind of put ourselves at risk by going out and, and making that transaction happen. But when you go to somebody's car, it's like, how do you, what experience can you really make for them when they're sitting in their car? Other than like, hi, what type of flavor would you want? One scoop, two scoop, three scoop. Right. And so there was that challenge of like trying to figure out what our business model was going to look like. How do we provide that to the guest? And then ultimately how do we keep everybody safe through that whole process? And um, my, my, was, my gut, just in talking to a lot of the business owners that I deal with in some of my consulting business and otherwise, and, and family that, you know, I come from a long line of small business owners was exactly what you were saying. Like you were going to have all of those thoughts, regardless of government intervention, and we're going to do everything you could to keep your family safe. And you had like uncertainty is the biggest killer of, you know, growth for a business. How much of what you just described was just your natural thought around the pandemic and how much of that was forced on you by local policymakers? Um, it was all our natural thought. So all of that was just our own doing and what we thought would work best uh, and then for how our business much and for our guests how much more uncertainty was introduced into your life as California has increased their policies and policy making uh, initiatives? Hundredfold. I mean, <laughs> every time that there is a policy change or anytime that there is anything that, uh, you know, they introduce or even a thought that they throw out into the air makes it more challenging for us as a business. Because even if they put a thought like, oh, well, you know, they, did a, they released a study, which has been then been backtracked about like how restaurants are a large cause of spreading that and like California backed it. And they were like, this is, this is the truth. And so then, you know, we have people that come in and be like, well, this is a place that causes coronavirus to spread. And it's like, we're the most clean sanitary space that you're probably going to walk into today. Everything has been sanitized. Everything is sanitized multiple times per customer, uh, let alone, you know, you know, just in our day-to-day -day normal operations. And so um, one of the things that, you know, a lot of the restaurant owners in our area have really talked about um, and tried to express through the local media is that, you know, our industry is one of the highest regulated as far as health and safety standards out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I heard on uh, one of your other podcasts, when you talked to uh, an individual that worked in the restaurant industry, like he was right in that, you know, we have these regulations. We want to be clean because we don't want other outbreaks. We don't want people to get salmonella or to get a foodborne illness. And so we follow very strict precautions as well. In our particular business, we're a dairy, uh, we're considered a state dairy plant because we pasteurize mm. our own milk bases for ice cream on site. So we're inspected quarterly. We're required, they like swab our floors and our equipment for bacteria and different things like that on a regular basis. So we're really required already by government regulation to be clean that we'd probably do on our own despite that, because the last thing I want to do is get one of our customers sick. That's going to, that's going to end people walking in our door. If somebody finds out they're getting sick from our environment. Right. And so, um, so doing all those things naturally to us, it's like really the cleaning aspect of things, the hand washing, the clean, the, you know, sanitation stuff that didn't change at all for us. We haven't changed that really maybe a little bit on the frequency, but that was our own choice because I'm like, Hey, after every customer, let's sanitize everything. Yeah. Um, but on the, you know, on having that chemicals in our store, having those resources available there, we're all already existing. And so um, kind of going back to the original question is that like every time the government threw out something different, it just, it made us have to then rechange what we were doing when what we were doing was already sufficient, if not over the top for what they were doing but their insight then just made it more confusing for our guests and for the general public to like, well, they're not doing this, so they need to do that. And I'm not gonna go there if it's because the government says that's what they need to do. And in reality, no, we, we, we don't because we have these things in place and they're not seeing these other elements that we're doing. So 
Yeah, instead of you turning it into a marketing opportunity, they're trying to look like they're important. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, here in Indiana, I mean, the, there are still restrictions, you know, seating restrictions, for instance, in the episode you referenced. Um, you'll hear a little bit about that once that is published. But, you know, California, like, and I, I talk, when I talk to other libertarian podcast hosts, I'm like, you have to understand, like, in Indiana, like, masks are optional here. And like when the governor tried a mask mandate, all the sheriffs said, no, we're not doing that. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, it just doesn't, um, it's a different experience here versus Philadelphia or LA or Chicago or wherever, right? Um, give us a sense of what it's like in terms of government overreach through the pandemic. You know, how much of what was put in place is still there? I mean, here in Indiana, I mean, we had two months where it was really kind of restricted and then they kind of said, well, we're not doing this anymore. Once the, once the election was over, <laughs> then, <laughs> then Holcomb opened a lot of stuff up. Um, you know, how much of it has lasted? I mean, is there any sign of anything letting up? I mean, how, how overbearing has the state and local, first, where are you at and, and how overbearing have they been? Um, so yeah, so in California in general, it's it's been pretty overbearing in general. Um, and I was going to try to look it up right before because I still haven't heard an end result to that. But a lot, of, and I guess where I'll go with this, is a lot of the overreach has happened or they'll put the overreach out there. Like in California right now, we, I believe, are still in a shelter in place. And I say believe because the communication on the other end when things end has not been very clear. Mm. It's like, you know, a back page press release in the newspaper when things are over and when that requirement is done. But of course, it's a front page press release when in big bold with a picture of our governor saying, we're doing this for your safety uh, on the front side. And so we've been in a shelter in place that was supposed to be for three weeks, but I think now has gone on for two months um, to the point where now local restaurants that still aren't supposed to be a providing even outdoor seating. Um, have started open up that outdoor seating because they're just like, we're not hearing anything on the other end. So we're just going to start doing it on our own. And if they come and tell us that we can't, then so be it. Um, our, our local government has been, it's been challenging because there has been like, well, we're not going to enforce that, but then they do enforce it. And so there's been a lot of miscommunication on like how that enforcement is going to happen. Um, but I would say that the biggest overreach has just been, uh, really around the lockdowns. It's like, you know, they, we do a shelter in place and it's like, nobody can be, a, nobody can do this. All you can do is take out or all you can do is this set, set things. I mean, I have a friend that owns a barbershop that hasn't been open since last March. That's crazy. I mean, are they just out of business? I mean, are they totally done or how, how, how are those people surviving? Have they moved on to other industries? No, I mean, fortunately he was in his place where he was close to retirement low rent space that he was in. So he was just able to like, he's kind of just like, I get time at home with my family and we're going to do this. But um, some of his sons that also worked at the barbershop are starting to cut hair in their garage. Um, uh, one of the- Right, like how do you expect <laughs> people to get their hair? I mean, it, over the course, I need one a month. Yeah. They uh, literally, like they literally aren't letting people get their hair cut in like the places. Like that's the crazy thing. It's like, fifty thousand dollars in indiana if you want to get a haircut a hairstylist license basically because you have to go to school and they you you lose your license if you get caught moonlighting like that but then you're going to force people into moonlighting in, in instead of the well regulated the whole point of your licensing is betrayed by by the lockdowns i mean that's the crazy part is how many much of that stuff like are, how do you get your hair cut well, what's interesting is a lot of what we're seeing now in California is a lot of very prohibition era type things. Um, <laughs> right. So even like even restaurants that are doing outdoor seating now, like you call once, you call a second time and the second time they'll answer or you leave a reser you leave a voicemail on their on their voicemail that we'd like to make a reservation for two for outdoor seating. And then you get a text message back saying, yes, your reservation is confirmed. And then you can do. So there's not even like online reservations for um, for food. Like 
because they don't want to put it out on the internet that they're actually taking the reservation. So if you know the rules on how to get a seat at this restaurant, and that's how you go about doing it. Um, a lot of the uh, even gyms or other, you know, um, beauty salons, massage places, uh, uh, hair salons, um, they've gone to uh, one stein, once uh, one view way decals. And so they're covering up their windows entirely from the outside. But when you're inside, you can obviously see out. Um, and then the doors are always locked. It says closed on the door. You have to call your stylist like on their personal phone number to like get a, uh, an appointment made. You go in through the back door um, and then you can get your hair cut in the salon with basically the front lights off. So it looks like the place is closed and you leave out the back door, not saying a word to anybody that you got your hair cut. I mean, that so we're, is just insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're seeing a lot of that. Um, you are seeing some cities like we have a, a neighboring city to us that. Um, has really just backed off regulation. So if you go to their downtown, their downtown's open, restaurants are open, salons are open, um, but you're just, you're seeing disparity in like each city. So that city right now is getting so much tax money because everybody from our city, that's an even bigger city than that one is going there to eat. It's going there for their haircuts. It's going there for using the gym. They're going there for those things um, to avoid not being able to do it in our city so hmm. that's just really truly insane um <laughs> so you mentioned you had a cafe i mean are you i imagine if you're not allowed to get your hair cut you're not having in inside seating in the cafe yet are you we are not no so um we uh uh we currently serve like we have our shop entirely closed off to the front door and so we have a table that blocks our front door and that's where our register is and so people walk up to our front door can never step foot into our actual shop um, and order their coffee there um it's done some innovative things for us uh, a local tech company offered a, a pretty sweet deal after the pandemic hit for creating an app for your business and so our cafe was able to get an app that probably initially we wouldn't have ever been able to afford and so now we have online ordering through an app that's you know branded specifically for us, that's designed for specifically for us, uh, and is great. So we can you know provide that, and that will continue on past this. Um, but for the actual service, people can't walk in, so they're not getting that cafe experience. It's really just a here, come get your coffee and and see you later. So, um, and one of the things that was interesting about that is we were able to at. at many different times, not consistently, but in, in little packets of time, we were able to offer outdoor seating for our guests um, at both our ice cream shop and our cafe. Um, and at one of those times, our city actually got a grant uh, for COVID related relief or support to small businesses, um, especially main street businesses where, was where the specific area was and where our cafe is, is in like a bar district. So you'd consider us a main street cafe um, and so the city dumped a bunch of money into creating parklets um, for businesses so they could have additional outdoor seating. Um, and no joke, about two weeks after the parklets all got installed in the business, California put the shelter in place, order in place, and outdoor seating was not allowed. So our city sent, spent about $35,000 per parklet at uh, a I want to say 12 businesses in this main street area, um, four parklets. They gave us 10 seats that really only four people could sit there if you actually implemented social distancing at those seats. Um, and so we built these parklets at 35 grand a piece, four seats at each one for outdoor dining. And then two weeks after they were installed, we haven't been able to use them ever since. Um, and that that's kind of the madness that we're seeing here is that like, they're doing all of these things and then not really being able to actually do them. Yeah, that, I mean, like I said, in Indiana, there was uh, the temporary part. I mean, it's not all, all roses here, but it's at least been somewhat predictable. In the beginning, Holcomb, was, the, the governor here was not very communicative, but then sort of got the hint from business owners like if you're not going to be open and transparent with where you're going and what you're doing you, you you're you're going to tick us off and like indiana is very sensitive to corporate 
<laughs> corporate uh, <laughs> outreach. It's very because Indianapolis specifically has a very uh, a system of private institutions that fund a lot of things that normally the government in like California might fund. So like the Lilly Endowment with Eli Lilly, they fund a ton of stuff. So they carry a, a tremendous amount of weight. So it's been very predictable here. And, you know, they give you months warning if they're like thinking about something, right? Um, from what little I've seen is California has been the exact opposite. That unpredictability has just made your job and the knee jerk oh, it's ticking up. Let's go back. Let's need your, like that has to just be a, I mean, most people like, I don't like wearing a mask. So that's part of like why I stay home a lot, but we do <laughs> go to restaurants, you know, we do go to, you know, and most of them are kind of at capacity at this point. And our rates are really not that much worse than yours in California. It just seems to me to be an incredible overreach and overkill across the board. I mean, how much? Well, that, go, ahead, gonna, go ahead and speak uh, on that uh, before I move. Yeah, on. I was just going to say that the moving target is the hardest thing. And I think in many realities, there, there have been businesses that have gone out of business um, during this pandemic that could have survived had there been more consistency um, because they tried to keep hitting that moving target. So they dropped a couple thousand here to you know, add 20 more seats to their outside patio and then the patio gets closed. And then, then they have to lay off employees and then they hire new people because the old people they laid off won't come back and so they hire new people and they train and then they have to lay them off again because they close out outdoor dining again. And, and so this like constant moving target for us, I mean, the amount of money that we have spent as a business in 2020, just to, just to keep up with trying to offer a different service, like with our ice cream shop, I just made a decision of like, Hey, this is what we're going to do. This kind of works for every scenario. And that's what we're doing. And if we can open up further, I'm going to hold off and not do that. And it may cost us a little business, but I'm tired of spending money chasing this dream of getting more service or customers because a new regulation comes or goes and goes away. And so I kind of did that, but there are other businesses that like, I know some restaurants that have taken out loans to build outdoor eating structures that then have never been able to use them. And so they're now paying a loan on 10 to $15,000 for something they can't even use because at one point, California said, yes, you can do outdoor dining. It's the safest way to do dining. We're gonna leave this open for you. It's the one way we want you to survive. And then six months, six weeks later, they're like, and hey, you know what, no, we're still having a problem. It's, it's, it's not okay for you guys to have people dining outside. And so, you know, if you're in a hole and you're thinking, well, if I can put 20 seats outside and keep my business alive, that's worth that investment. And then you make that investment and then you can't even do that. Um, there was a, even a restaurant tour in uh, the LA area that spent, um, I think it was close to $8 million adding patios to his 11 restaurants in the LA area. Three days after he completed all of the patios in those areas, LA shut down. And, didn't only allow takeout food at all restaurants. I mean, I, if I dropped 8 million and then all of a sudden the government told me I couldn't use it, I'd probably still be using those patios. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, I, 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 I recommended civil disobedience because it's worked here in Indiana. I mean, there's no doubt about it that the, the business owners, like uh, I'm going to interview one group that is suing the state and there's a good chance that they win. Um, it, it is the climate in California where they just don't care? Like they don't care about your voice. They don't care about what is happening to you in any way, shape or form. I mean, I, I can't imagine that the restaurant association just kind of like looks the other way and doesn't say anything. I mean, it is, are they really that cold hearted? Well, the restaurant, the California Restaurant Association, association is doing a ton. I mean, I get, two to three daily briefings from them of lawsuits they've started. Um, they just ran um, one case like all the way up to the Supreme Court with the County of LA. Um, and so they're, I mean, they're doing tirelessly, they are trying to fight for us. Um, I just feel like Sacramento 
is going to do what they want to do and they don't really hear anybody else. And it's like, we're smarter than the rest of you. And so this is our process is now we're doing it. Um, and so it's, it sounds like everything that we scream and yell, it's just going on deaf ears. Um, and there's been a lot of more than I've ever seen in my history, um, of politicians just going quiet. Like they just disappear. Like they, they, they come out, here's our plan. This is what we're going to do. Everybody Shame has hates that. It. Shame has it, that uh, tendency. Yeah. Like people do that. Yeah. A, 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 you know, and here's what we're going to do. This is going to keep everybody safe. And then they just disappear. And like, council members to our mayor to you know to county officials they they just we don't hear from them i mean you don't hear about them on the news and you know fortunately local news has had plenty to cover with the election and trump and everything going on there and so all the local stuff and even california stuff just disappears and so it even makes it more challenging for us as a business owner because we're just not hearing like this recent shelter in place that was supposed to be 3 weeks it's now been over two months. There hasn't been any update. It's kind of like, you know, and uh, our governor was doing like daily updates there for a while. He stopped doing those and it just kind of just kinda went quiet. And so now it's like, well, are we just free to do what works for us? Or are you going to take away our licenses because we're doing these things? Um, and so that has been uh, the new challenge. Before it was the moving target. They're constantly telling us, or do this, do this, do this. And now it's like, we've told you to do this and now we're just not going to talk to you anymore. And so. How, how, what, like, I imagine that you talk with other business owners, you know, in your community. I mean, what's the remedy here? Is it running for office? Is it, you know, uh, what sort of punishment are you planning? <laughs> Nonviolent <laughs> civil disobedience are you planning uh, to, to rectify the situation? Um, well, I know a lot of the associations and a lot of the restaurants have kind of teamed up together. Um, and so I think there will probably be a lot of lawsuits, um, on the other side. Um, I know of a couple restaurants that plan on filing suits. Um, some of, some of the more bigger ones, um, have, have planned on that. And I'm sure the smaller guys will jump on board with that. Um, and I know the restaurant association has plan has a lot of kind of lawsuits and um, challenges to the state plan in the next year. Um, and there are some people that are like going that route of like running for office or planning to change or get more involved in local politics because of this. So there there might be that benefit of of other people coming up through the woodwork because um, it's kind of getting fed up with the whole. Uh, process and how this this thing has been handled. I mean, if you were to, this is an impossible question maybe, but <laughs> I don't think there's any doubt that the pandemic was going to cause people to stay home. Like I can see people now as we're starting to tiptoe into spring, kind of just go, all right, you know, I, this is going to come across like really heartless because I know the seriousness of 400,000 people in America dying, 2 million across the world, like, obviously, this is a very serious situation. You want to keep people healthy. But most people don't know someone who has experienced a death. Or, and if they do, they take it more seriously than people who kind of have not had that experience. Right. And mm -hmm. so those people kind of go, well, I'm just not I'm not willing to play ball anymore. It's not real. It's not you know, I'm not seeing this. I don't feel I'm in danger. You know, I personally had it. I mean, I know I'm at still at risk for it, but it's kind of like, I know the next one's going to be less. So it's like, I can live a little freer, right? With my personal safety. I, all of these people are making their own judgments in terms of their own personal risk and the risk to people around them. Um, and calculating that this is not always going away and rates are starting to drop because of the vaccine, right? That doesn't change that people's behavior was going to change and that people were going to make different choices and that businesses were going to have to adjust and, you know, businesses that weren't doing well, we're going to go out of business in a downturn anyways. How do you, how, if you were to put a percentage of the impact of the pandemic versus the lockdowns, like we'd be back where we were, you know, the, the we've lost. So here's an example, like of what I'm asking, we've lost 50% of our revenue. We probably would have lost 20% due to the pandemic, but that other 30% was lockdowns. Like, 
you know, maybe that's severe, maybe it's not severe. Like, do you have any idea kind of how much of a drop in business that you think government has cost you? Uh, I'd say, I'd probably say it'd be about 75% to 25%. So 75% has been caused due to lockdowns. And also I feel like misinformation or changing information. Um, I really fear, feel that fear like irrational fear has driven more of the loss in business than the actual like fear for what is true. Um, and so habits would have changed. I see that we're already seeing that. I think we're going to see long lasting effects of how those habits have changed because of the pandemic. Um, but I think like, you know, what we've noticed in our sales is a lockdown will happen. Um, and then the sale, the sales coming off of that are slow to recover. Um, and I think because of that lockdown, people have a, a higher sense of fear. Um, and I, I, I'm like you, Chris, like I, I think it's a real thing. I think that it's a serious thing. I think there is a sense of fear that should be had. Um, but I think that fear has been heightened to some hysteria in many cases. And people have, uh, just felt like, I can't go out anywhere. You know, I, like, I saw one I, article where like literally the person, so we were at BW3s on the patio enjoying a meal like October, I think it was. And the lady near us said, well, yeah, this is this, it's her birthday. She was with two, two girls, her daughters. And she goes, you know, it's her eighth birthday. And we just wanted to get out of the house and their dad's really worried. He hasn't left the house since March. And I went like literally hasn't stepped foot across the threshold because no, not at all. And like for all the people who kind of like we as libertarians swim in the anti-mask like conspiratorial side. So like we have an understanding. I think it's hard for us to see like how really truly freaked out the mainstream media has made some people, you know, and, and how that kind of pulls the other side a little towards them where it's just like, there's literally no reason unless you are severely compromised to not go out of your house. And even then in New York, that's where most of the people, most of the people who died in New York never left their house, right? It was mm -hmm. coming in other ways. So it's just sort of, uh, sort of an insane thing where you're exactly right, where I've talked to people that just are like, well, we don't, we don't go to restaurants. We don't, we go out once a week to the store and, and that's their choice. That's fine. It's just not the choice that my family and I have made. And, you know, we go out to restaurants that are local. We don't go out to chains. We tip 30% usually at least. Um, I mean, how have your employees kind of handled all this? I mean, how much of a hit has it been for them? Um, so yeah, to your first point a little bit, like, yeah, the, the fear, and I know people too that haven't left their house. I know people that have, you know, quarantined for months straight and then, you know, they're one time out, they went to the park or they, they haven't eaten at restaurants. And I think too, kind of in, in connection with the lockdowns is especially in the restaurant industry. And I'll, I can speak specifically to that, but there has been just such this like restaurant restaurants and the food service hospitality industry are, are the evil in this like and i feel like a lot of what the government has done has placed marks on certain industries as being what is bad and what is causing this rather than looking at the big picture and being like it can happen anywhere it can happen if you even if you leave your house don't leave your house i mean you can get a package in the mail and get it from there or it can come from other areas that you know i i'm not a scientist so i'm not saying that like it comes from this but like there's so many other areas and i i know people that have gotten coronavirus that don't leave their house and it's like, right. so how is that pro possible? Or, you know, it's coming in from, like you said, from other areas. And so I think in tied with the lockdowns, I think the, the struggle with the government has been is they have, they have made marks in certain industries as evil in this, this pandemic. Um, and that has hurt those industries more than just if the coronavirus had come and, and been here without additional feeding of fear into that. Um, yeah, I mean, I work in radio where most of the revenue is dependent on events, live events. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's it's decimated my industry in a lot of ways. And and it, not that I think people last year were going to go to live concerts with 100,000 people, but they might this summer. 
You know, they might mm-hmm. towards the end of the year now that they've gotten the vaccine and they feel a little more comfortable. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, um, what about PPP? Because we've only just got about five minutes left here. Okay. Um, you know, did you try to access PPP? How's that system gone for you? Uh, so that's been another interesting system. So uh, we did apply for first round PPP for both of our businesses. Um, our ice cream shop, we had a very strong, we have a very strong relationship with our bank. Um, and with that bank specifically with all of their clients, they were very like forward about helping us through that and getting us into the PPP program. Um, and so they opened up their applications really easy. There was a lot of, uh, easy process to get that PPP loan or loan app in, um, our cafe, on the other hand, we don't have a relationship with that bank. It's a bigger bank. It's, it's, um, you know, not necessarily as much customer focused, um, and we actually, I think it was like the Wednesday after it opened, went to apply and they said, sorry, we're already closed on our PPP funding Holy cow! within like three days. Uh, and so we were fortunate enough that I was in a program through Goldman Sachs a couple of years ago, uh, called 10,000 small businesses. Um, and that program, uh, th- for their, uh, alumni, they opened up, um, a special funding through a bank that they had a connection with, which was the CDC, like the. CDC bank in the East coast. And so we were able to apply through that. Um, and they made it super simple. And it was like just those graduates that were able to apply through that program. Um, and we were able to get it, uh, that time, but we would have completely missed out had we not had that option to us. Um, and if we had been a business that just didn't really have a relationship with our bank. Um, and so, yeah, on the other side, on the forgiveness side, once again, kind of a, a, a moving target. Initially, when they released stuff, uh, my bank for the, the ice cream shop sent out the link, like, here's how you apply for forgiveness. It was this big, long process. There was lots of documents that need to be pulled. Um, I gave it over to our CPA. Um, and by the time our CPA had that stuff prepared, they had changed the process and changed the application. Uh, so then they changed what they were doing, went to submit it, and it had changed again. Um, and now we're down to a single page forgiveness application for our PPP loan um, from what would have been like 16 documents and like, you know, a whole Bible worth of uh, things that you had to fill out. Um, as for our cafe through that uh, additional bank, uh, they have even been sent out the forgiveness application because their email to us is, we're going to wait until this all settles and finalizes. We don't fear that there's going to be any challenging on how the forgiveness process will work. We want to make sure it's as simple as possible for you and that we have all the correct information before we require you to apply for that forgiveness. So we haven't even gotten an app, uh, forgiveness application for that, uh, for that loan. Um, I knew a lot and, of people who, who were, who were sketchy about signing up for PPP or any form of federal assistance because they didn't want to have to pay it back on the back end that, you know, the forgiveness, it was like guaranteed. Oh, well you get these and you prove and it'll be easy and you'll get it forgiven. And I just knew a lot of business owners that went, I'm not falling for that. <laughs> yeah. And I, I had the same skepticism. I just saw it as something that we needed to do um, if we were going to adjust. I mean, we closed for about two months. Uh, we were actually fully closed because um, we saw it as the best interest in both our guests and our staff. Um, and so we paid some of our staff through that time. We did some delivery. We did some side things trying to make it work. Um, but yeah, I, I just saw it as the only real means for keeping our business moving forward while not having the normal revenue that we have and still covering rent and utilities and all of those things that don't change. Um, you know, those, despite not making as much money, those things don't really change much. We're still going to pay the same utility, same rent, a lot of our same supply costs. Um, it's only our cost of goods that we're able to lower as we slow down. And so, um, and I took the PPP money thinking, I'm going to keep my staff employed. I'm going to keep them making hopefully equivalent or around the thing that they were making before. Um, and so we were able to do that with that, with that money. So uh, we that, are applying. Is, uh, is that, did that happen? I did. Yeah. Um, and so we were able to keep pretty much everybody on. Um, we've lost some staff that were already planning to leave, but for the most part, we've kept um, everybody that was around in March uh, when we first closed our doors um, are still with us. Um, and most of them have been able to make generally, I mean, we're a seasonal business and we're also the food industry, which is kind of feast or famine. 
uh, a little bit. And so they've all, for the most part, have been able to maintain their normal, normal income. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a catch 22. I mean, I've heard, you know, the PPP program talked about like as a takings program where they took so much revenue from your business by implementing so many regulations that they're, they owe you <laughs> recompense <laughs> for basically what they've taken. And I'm sure as a libertarian, you're just like, man, this is, feels like dirty money. But if you can keep your people employed, if you can keep, you know, your business afloat, I mean, did the federal funds, did the, the assistance that you received keep your doors open? It did. Um, and I think more importantly, it continued for us to offer health insurance uh, it allowed us to continue offering the benefits that we offer our staff. And so um, it was those type of things that we were worried about, you know, we're in a health crisis. And then also you have to cut somebody's health insurance because you can't pay that. I mean, yeah. um, we're a small business and our, our health insurance uh, is upwards of $3,000 a month. Wow. Um, and when you're not making any income or much reduced income, just to keep that bill that could easily be a one phone call. And a lot of health companies were, open to canceling contracts mid month and, and things like that for businesses during that time that like we could have easily canceled that, but we don't want to take that away from our staff um, when we are in the middle of a health crisis. So um, yeah, so it, 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 it was a gut check in many cases um, taking that money and, and looking at that financial aid. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, we, it is because of the government that we are having to make these restrictions that are affecting our business. Um, and seeing that most of our loss of income was coming from those regulations and those standards, and those stipulations, it made it a little bit easier to kind of go, we can do this because it's going to benefit, you know, it wasn't money going into my pocket um, at all. Uh, if anything, we've taken less this year than we have in past years um, because the profit wasn't there. And so it wasn't like it was just flowing through and we're like, oh, well, now we're going to make investments, but we made investments that were beneficial to our staff and to our guests. So, and that was what was important to us. All right. Well, final thoughts. I mean, what would you just like to, to say to folks on this platform, you know, anything else that kind of has stuck out to you that people ought to know? Well, that's a tough question after everything we've talked about. Um, I think, the reality is that, um, yeah, that it, supporting supporting those businesses, the small businesses that are out there that are still surviving and that are doing that um, is hugely important. We need it more than anything now. Um, but also like understanding that both the staff and those businesses are constantly dealing with change and having that understanding and that uh, appreciation for that uh, because we definitely have had a lot of challenging customers, people that view things different ways than we do. Um, and we're just all trying to swim in the ocean, the right direction and get to the end. Um, yeah, and the, so the person who's walking in without the mask and is going to tell you that they're not wearing their mask in your property. Well, you can pay the thousand dollar ticket that, that poor Jeff has to pay <laughs> when, when he gets caught by code enforcement. Like that's the kind of like lack of concern for other people that has really bugged me. Like, I don't like wearing a mask either, but not to the point that I'm going to cost someone else money based on my principled stance. Like that just seems like, that seems like so rude to me, you know, and I'm sure you get it on the other side, the people who are like, this isn't six feet enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, it's just, everybody's so amped up and it's just such a bummer. Yeah. So I think like, I think a big thing is, is just showing your lover, your, your lover, your neighbor, uh, your, <laughs> your neighbor, uh, love and respect. And, you know, I think that's what all of us need a little bit more of, um, during this and, um, just paying respect to others and other people's feelings, um, in this process. And, um, it's all uncomfortable for all of us, whether it's because you're wearing a mask or somebody else is not wearing a mask, it's all uncomfortable. And so just having that, that respect, um, and love for the neighbor that, uh, that is standing next to you because, uh, it's all of us together that are going to get us through this and not some government or some politician telling us what to do. So uh, uh, kind of end with that. Business, just in case there's somebody in your local area. I know last time you were on, somebody's like, holy cow, I go to that ice cream store all the time. I mean, so if there is anybody that can support you in some some way, 
Where's yeah. your business and what, what are the name of them? Uh, so our ice cream shop is called Ampersand Ice Cream. Uh, we're in Fresno, California. Um, and our cafe is The Review. Um, and it's like a TV review. So R-E-V-U-E. -E, uh, and that's also in Fresno, California. And so, um, yeah, cafe has been open for a little over three years. And our ice cream shop will be six years this May. So. Well, thank you so much for being a Wall Plus member and being such a generous one, especially in these tough times. I, I want you to know I have truly appreciated that uh, and know that, that that's more of a sacrifice than normal, probably, and really want to thank you for, for that personally. And thank you for coming on today. I think this is an important story for people to understand that small business owners are the backbone of this country. They're the backbone of employers, and they are going to take care of people, and they can handle taking care of people without the government interference because it just makes things worse. Yep. So, absolutely. all right, Jeff. Well, thanks Bennett, for having me on, Chris. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to the Chris Spangle Show and we'll talk to you soon.